Welcome everyone to this webinar brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abitronistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong strategic national security oriented policies. Our movement consists of more than 20,000 people here in Israel, including many reserve officers and operators from all branches of the Israel Defense establishment who believe that strong national security and staunch Zionism are necessary for Israel to be the eternal homeland of the Jewish people. Thank you to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into these war briefings. It's so important that we are able to share these updates and analysis with you. We are joined today by Brigadier General Amir Avivi, founder and chairman of IDSF, as well as Colonel Richard Kemp, a very special treat to have the Colonel with us right now. We'll begin, of course, with the update by the General. General Avivi, please. Oshaya, thank you very much. Um, I think that we are uh, reaching a defining moment in the war in Gaza. Uh, I encourage all of you to follow very closely the next week or two. Um, I think the pressure on Hamas is uh, mounting uh, and is going to grow and grow. Um, and uh, when you talk about the uh, military operations, about wars, there is something uh, um, uh, called like a, a moment where the enemy is uh, on the verge of breaking. And I think that we are getting closer uh, to this moment. Um, and uh, the IDF is going to really uh, enhance the pressure uh, dramatically uh, in order to really bring Hamas on their knees. Um, the fighting overall is very uh, fierce in Khan Yunus. Uh, in the north, we are pretty much in control of the northern part of, uh, uh, of Gaza. Um, the army is working very hard, creating a perimeter, a one kilometer perimeter inside Gaza, cleaning all the houses and everything that is closed uh, for um, the way this will look uh, in the future. Uh, but we're also attacking fiercely uh, in Khanunes. There were. Uh, and we see behind the scenes also talk about a hostage uh, deal. Uh, but this is something we need to, to see how it evolves. The more the pressure will be, the bigger the chances that Hamas uh, will want a deal. And uh, also their ability to demand will go down. In the north, all the time there are clashes with Hezbollah along uh, along the, the borders. Uh, Hezbollah is uh, more emboldened. We see more shooting. But... I think we lost the general right there. His internet connection must have gone down. As, as our viewers know, General Avivi is very busy. He is always on the road. Oh, I think he's back. Let's see. The driving to the TV. Moshe, can you hear me? General, we lost you for a second, but you're back. Yes. Yeah. So I, I said Hezbollah is a very emboldened and is shooting all the time. Uh, but the IDF is attacking constantly. Um, we had some top meetings um, in the uh, government uh, this week, uh, among other things, we met, we met with the, the Minister of Strategy, Ron Dermer, a very interesting discussion, and we focused a lot on the day after. What is going to happen uh, the day after? This is a very, very important discussion. We have prepared a very detailed paper discussing this. Uh, of course, we are not willing to have not Hamas, not Jihad, not Palestinian Authority. We suggest dividing Gaza into five regions and building a local uh, management in the cities. 
but one of the most important things we, we discuss is the need to denazificate Gaza, change completely uh, the education system, uh, get take out UNRWA and all these terrible organizations, and build something that is similar maybe to uh, what we have in the UAE or in Saudi Arabia uh, that are changing the whole uh, atmosphere in their countries. Having said that, um, I think there will also be many Gazans who will choose to leave Gaza and we're not going to stop them. Um, I think there will be a big change in this place. But at this stage, we are in the military stage and reaching, I think, uh, from my, uh, what I see and the way I see the coming weeks, a very defining moment uh, in this war. And I hope we see really the beginning of the fall uh, of Hamas. The, the divisions, the command, the army is doing a, a very good job. Uh, today, by the way, my deputy, Aaron, uh, commanded an attack on a brigade commander uh, of Hamas in the central camps that was very successful, and they got them so mad that they shot Tel Aviv. But also this eventually, in a, in a certain moment, will they won't be able to do. So I would conclude by saying that I'm uh, optimistic from what I'm seeing on the ground. Thank you, General Avivi. It's a great pleasure to be joined by Colonel Richard Kemp. And I have to say, since we began these briefings shortly after October 7th, um, as, a, as a kind of a, an ideology or a policy, we decided to only have Israeli experts and Israelis on this program. We wanted to, to bring briefings from Israel. We're making our first exception today well worth it uh, for Colonel Richard Kemp, who actually is now in Israel uh, since shortly after October 7th. And there was actually an article, Colonel, and the article I saw in the, in the in the Ynet said that Israel's biggest advocate is not even Israeli, and it was referring to you. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's a great treat. Why don't we begin? Maybe you can share with our viewers why you came to a war zone. Now you know you know you know war zones, but why did you come to a war zone? Why did you come to Israel after October seventh? Thank you very much, Moshe, and. Um... It's a, a real honor to be the first non-Israeli on your uh, team, and uh, and also not just the first non-Israeli, but probably the first Goy as well, or maybe maybe not, but, but probably one of them. And I'm also an extremely adept Shabbat Goy, if anyone needs one. Um, I, I came here because um, I, I've been following the conflict in Israel very closely for many years, uh, and I find that if I'm going to make a contribution, and my contribution really can only be relatively small, but based on my own military experience of fighting this type of enemy in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. But I think it, it, it it's helpful to bring some kind of external perspective to what's going on here, and that's very often sorely missing. And indeed, I was in Ukraine just a few days before the October the 7th and spent a fair bit of time there on the front lines observing the way they were operating and fighting. And I find that actually being present, whether it's in Ukraine or here in Israel, you can make a much more, I think, authoritative and informed contribution than you can sitting behind a computer screen in Britain. Amazing. Let me ask you, did you come here alone for all of this time or you have other people with you? No, no one, no one wants to come with me. I've been here on my own, but I've not been alone because I've been I've been traveling a lot around the country and I've been staying in a hotel in Tel Aviv, which is full of refugees from Kiryat Shimona. And there were many refugees from Ashkelon. And these are now my family. So I'm far from alone. I've, I've uh, got used to living among ordinary, everyday Israelis here in the hotel I'm in. What do you think there? What is your sense of their kind of resolve right now in terms of being evacuated from their homes, living in a hotel? Do they seem downtrodden and depressed? Is it like other war zones that you visited? Well, it's a very nice hotel, but but um, staying in a very nice hotel, if, if you're not on holiday and, and you've been here for several months, 
I think wears very thin and the people are, are desperate to get back home. The ones from Ashkelon are now back in Ashkelon. Um, the Kiryat Shimona people, they, they, they really do want to go back, but they also know that they can't go back while the threat of Hezbollah hangs over their heads. So they're all, they're all, I think, sitting on the edge of their chairs, waiting to see what the Israeli government is going to do about Hezbollah. And quite clearly, something has got to change up there, whether it's changed through diplomatic pressure, which I personally, I doubt is going to happen, or through military force, which I think would be effective, uh, albeit, you know, very, very difficult and very bloody. Uh, I think they, they, they have to have that before they can really contemplate going back home to what is effectively a, a war zone. But having said all that, the morale of the people here is nevertheless very high. They they have many problems, but they know they know that that, 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 that you know that the I think that the IDF is fighting extremely hard to restore normality to Israel. And that's another thing I would say about my experience meeting IDF soldiers. I've met many IDF soldiers up on the border with Lebanon. I've met, I've been inside Gaza a few times. I've met many IDF soldiers there fighting against Hamas. And not only is their fighting proficiency for a, as a professional soldier, I'm speaking, extremely impressive, but also their, their morale, I found, is sky high and probably higher than you find in the average military force that's been fighting pretty intensively for a long period of time. And that, of course, is because, you know, you know better than I do, because they're fighting on their doorstep and they know it's not thousands of miles away in Afghanistan or Iraq. They know they're fighting for their family, their friends, their brothers and sisters and their countrymen. So you've been in Gaza. You clearly have seen IDF operations. The world wants to make claims that Israel is violating war crimes, that Israel is using disproportionate force. What do you say to all of that? Well, it's entirely predictable because there is this narrative that whatever Israel does, it's wrong. Israel is illegitimate, uh, is a, 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 an occupier, an imperialist, is a, an apartheid state, has stolen Arab land. That whole narrative has taken a really firm grip in the West. And therefore, uh, even the, the horrific atrocities of the 7th of October, which and I, I watched the IDF video, the 45 minute video they put together. And, you know, I know as well as anyone who wasn't there how horrific it was. And most people see have seen a lot of that on the media. And even that can't shake in many people's minds this perception of Israel as something that's illegitimate. So these these are, of course, all lies. You know, I know it, I knew it before this war began. I know it even more since this war began that, that no country in the world fights uh, this kind of terrorism as effectively as Israel does, the IDF do. And no country in the world takes as great and as effective steps as, they, as Israel at minimizing civilian casualties in the combat zone. So what's being lied about in the media, in the United Nations, in many governments around the world, in universities, is the diametric opposite of reality. So I think you're in a very unique position because most of the people going into Gaza and reporting it are, are media professionals. You're a military person. So let's say, for example, the allegation that Israel is not using smart bombs and they're indiscriminately bombing and they're not taking care of civilian uh, casualties as a result. What would you say to that in terms of how an army needs to operate and what you've seen in other war zones? Well, I think it's a fact that Israel has used more smart munitions in this campaign, or should I say a greater percentage of smart munitions in this campaign than any other army ever has in any campaign. Um, yes, they, they have been using some what they call dumb bombs as well, but they've been using them uh, using, I think, some extraordinarily innovative tactics, including uh, in the air and also on the ground in terms of trying to move civilians away from the danger areas. So I think virtually all Israeli attacks, even the ones using dumb munitions, are precision attacks as precise as they can get. Um, and, and the IDF has gone to immense lengths to, to try and shift the civilian popular away, population away, while Hamas, of course, tries to keep them there because their objective is for as many guards and civilians to die as possible. And unfortunately, in the media, and, and some politicians have branded Israel's attempts to 
obey military, obey the laws of armed conflict by getting by warning people to leave as being some kind of enforced population movement against international law. And again, that is simply another lie. So if we were to compare what's happening in Gaza to what you've seen, let's say, in Afghanistan, would you say that Israel is, is operating above and beyond international law and, and Israel is doing everything it can? And if that's the case, why does the media, uh, why does the world have such uh, short vision in contrast to other war zones? I think if you compare it with any other war zone of its type, in other words, densely populated, built up areas, like, for example, Mosul, or, or you know, many other cities that I'll, I'll, I'll ignore the places that um, <clears throat> that countries like Russia and Syria have attacked because, you know, these are not democracies. They don't follow the laws of war. They deliberately break the laws of war. But other other democracies have fought. I think um, one of the one of the big differences here <clears throat> is that Israel has a far greater intelligence capability than for example, we had in Afghanistan or in Iraq, far, far greater in, inside Gaza. And that, you know, some people might think, well, that's kind of not true because of the intelligence failures of October the 7th. But my perception on that is those intelligence failures were more at a strategic and analytical level rather than the level of collection of intelligence. And, and the IDF's capability to collect intelligence, know where people are, know where the enemy is, identify targets and strike them precisely. I think it's something well above and beyond what what certainly we were able to do in Afghanistan and Iraq, and most other democratic armies have been able to do. And in, in fact, I was over here, I think just after the 2014 conflict with a group of retired former chiefs of staff from armies around the world. And every single one of them, about 15 of them from countries ranging from the United States to India, to Australia, to France, Germany, uh, Latin American countries, every single one of them said that their own armies would not be able to achieve the level of, um, uh, of, of uh, effect that the IDF has in minimizing civilian casualties. And that, to a very large extent, I think, is, is intelligence-based, not entirely, but very largely. So you make it so simple listening to you, and I, I believe every word you're saying, but then uh, I think about the BBC, and I think about, uh, you know, other, you know, reports coming out of the UK, which you're obviously very familiar with. What, what can you share with us about all of that? Well, I'm actually a human shield for the BBC. Um, I haven't been allowed. I speak on the BBC very frequently um, on TV and radio, no, normally about um, Afghanistan, Iraq, Ukraine, other conflicts. But never for the last 10 years or so, I've not been allowed to speak about Israel because they, they consider me to be one of their military experts, and yet this military expert doesn't follow their um, their narrative. And so if they have me on, it kind of attempts, it sort of undermines their narrative. So they've cut me off the airwaves on Israel for over 10 years. But then I suddenly got a call a few weeks ago from the BBC News Channel who said, please, can you do an interview for us on Israel? I almost fell off my chair. And then I suddenly realised why it was, and it was because... The BBC had come under intense pressure after their uh, condemnation of Israel for attacking the Al Ali hospital, which is Israel did not do. And they felt they needed to demonstrate their kind of, they see it from all sides angle. And, and so they were even prepared to have a, a, a Zionist extremist like me on the BBC, which they did. And I've done a few interviews with them now. But um, I think, you know, like BBC Sky News, so many other Western media organizations are absolutely intensely biased against Israel. They will bring on Israel spokesmen, of course, to tr to tr and, and very often try and make them look as if they're lying or make them, you know, un at least undermine their argument as, they, as best they can. There's always that in the, in, the, in, the, in the background of everything they do. And it comes back again down to this narrative that I mentioned of Israel being in the wrong, no matter what it does, it's wrong because it's an occupying power, it's a colonizer, it's, it's an apartheid state. The recent article in Accusations by the former Defense Minister of the UK, 
What can you share with us about that? And, and what should Israel's response be? Does it have an impact? Should Israel fight back on that, so to speak? Well, some of us have been fighting back on Israel's behalf, I suppose you could say. Ben Wallace, the former defense secretary, who was in post for, I think, five or six years, something like that, pretty well respected, ex-British Army officer. He was, I think he served six years in the British Army. Um, unusual for a, uh, a British defense secretary. He wrote an excoriating article about Israel, accusing Israel of, uh, of a, 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 I think it was a kind of like a rage of violence, something like that, and uh, unjustified and war crimes, including disproportionality, the normal old uh, chestnut that people drag up without knowing what it means, and also um, uh, deliberate killing of civilians, um, uh, forced movement of population, there's a string of other accusations against Israel, um, which were all false. Um, and I, I, he wrote he wrote this article in the Telegraph, and that had quite a lot of traction because he has a lot of um, authority in the UK and, and in other places in the world. He was a candidate to be NATO Secretary General, didn't make it. Um, and, and and I wrote an article rebutting him in the Telegraph and also in the Jewish in the Jewish Chronicle in the UK. And, and since then, I think today, for those people who are interested, the Jewish Chronicle has splashed an, a news article about Wallace's piece, which includes commentary from uh, four or five former British uh, army officers, military officers, including an admiral from the Royal Navy, General Julian Thompson, who commanded troops in the Falklands War, and others saying that Ben Wallace is completely wrong. Uh, and one of my concerns about him, I don't think what he says affects Israel directly, but unfortunately, by him kind of suggesting Israel is committing war crimes, that does, it, first of all, I think, give some sucker to Hamas. As um, General Avivi said, we may be approaching the point where Hamas is at breaking point. Let's hope so. He may be right. I hope he is. Um, but but giving sucker to Hamas in, in this way in the international stage, I think, doesn't help that. But more, even more significantly, I think, it provokes due hate around the world. We've seen a lot of anti-Semitic actions in the UK, US, other countries. And, and a man like Ben Wallace confirming that uh, Israel's carrying out war crimes uh, just incites that sort of thing. And, and, and you know, the pe people do believe what he says. And, and so I'm happy to say that a group of us were able to to, to counter his, uh, the, the, what I would, I would say, I wouldn't describe it as lies, he said, because I don't think he is lying. I think he just believes uh, Hamas propaganda that, and propaganda that's churned out elsewhere and, and doesn't have any desire to, 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 to stoke anti-Semitism, but has inadvertently been doing so. Okay, so you've seen the tr atrocities on the Gaza border. Um, so I'd like to ask you, and maybe General Vivi can uh, pipe in here as well, in terms of looking at the tactics, the ideology, the operations of Hamas, and comparing them to other terrorist entities you've seen, be it the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, do you think anything stands out in terms of who Hamas is, how they operate, how they fight? I think, I think Hamas, if you compare them to... I mean, actually, Ben Wallace attempted to compare, compare Hamas to... IRA terrorists that we fought in Northern Ireland for many years, which is totally, and I won't go into detail, we don't have time, but it's totally uh, off the mark there. But if you compare them to Taliban, Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, other jihadist groups, there's a lot in common. They, they use very similar tactics. They, they all use human shields. Um, they, they all make use of mosques, uh, hospitals, schools, other protective buildings to fight from and they try and lure our soldiers as they try and lure IDF soldiers into booby trap situations, sometimes successfully. These are all very common uh, among these groups. I, I would say one thing that stands out with Hamas, is, or two things perhaps with Hamas, is firstly, uh, I, I, what, having, I told you I watched that video that the IDF put together. And one of the things that struck me about that was the sheer joy and pleasure on their faces as they tore Jews apart, murdered them, raped them, butchered them, dragged them back into Gaza. That, that was something that gave them clearly enormous pleasure. And I haven't really seen it quite on that level before among other jihadist groups, some, some of them to an extent, but this was going further. 
And the other thing I'd say that stands out about Hamas is um, the, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, etc., more than happy to use human shields, more than happy to see innocent civilians die. But Hamas's policy, I believe, their overriding policy to bring about their objective is to, for the IDF to kill as many of their civilians as possible. I think it's the, I may be wrong here, but I think it's the only army, if you call it an army, in history that has deliberately tried to get its enemy to kill its own civilian population. Even the Taliban and uh, Islamic State, et cetera, did not do that quite so energetically as Hamas. And, and of course it works for Hamas because when, when you're fighting an enemy that not only uses human shields, but tries to force you into a situation where you're killing those civilians, as many of them as possible, then that does create um, a, a movement, a very strong movement on the world stage, which brings pressure onto Israel to, to stop doing what it's doing. And it gives legitimacy, unfortunately, to Hamas in the eyes of those people who are too blind to actually see the reality. Thank you. General Avivi, do you have anything to add on that point? Yeah, I think that uh, Hamas operates very similarly to ISIS. And this is why we said it's like ISIS. But definitely, um, the completely disregard to the society is uh, evident. And they even speak about it. They, they say it loud and clear. Um, Society is just uh, a tool for them to achieve uh, to achieve their goals. Um, they are definitely the, probably the most radical organization uh, we have seen, and this is why they need to be eradicated completely. And uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, this is what we'll do and achieve in this war. We all hope that happens soon. Colonel, final question. My understanding is that you are connected with the Friends of Israel Initiative. Are you able to share a little bit about what that does and what the aim is for this war? Well, the Friends of Israel Initiative is a, um, a group of retired or former, shall I say, not necessarily retired, former heads of state, cabinet ministers, and a few other distinguished people from around the world, all non-Jews who is it was formed by jose maria Aznar, the former president of spain and is now chaired by stephen harper the former prime minister of canada and the objective of that group is to um is to is to use their own networks in their own countries and in international bodies to behind the scenes try and get um the current leaders to to do what is bet what is right in relation to israel um the part of that organization is is something called the high level military group which consists of mainly of former chiefs of staff and other generals from armies around the world the the, the friends of israel initiative and the high level military group have been relatively inactive during this conflict because they have no money unfortunately and so they've been able to do very little but we're hoping to get some money together in order to bring a delegation over here probably late january of of military of generals from the high-level military group and some, um, some uh, maybe one or two leading politicians as well, to in order to to look at what's going on, to be able to provide some in, independent commentary on the way the conflict has been conducted, and give maybe our, our perspective on how the future should look and will look, whether it's in Gaza or in uh, up in in Lebanon as well. So I, I'm I'm relatively optimistic we're going to be able to do that, but we haven't done a great deal so far. I'm I'm, I'm very sorry to say because simply the resources haven't been there, and I'm I'm sure we're about to finish. But I would like to just echo General Avivi's sentiment that Israel's certainly going to win this war from my perspective. Uh, Israel's been the IDF has been doing a phenomenal job, and I've seen some of it firsthand. They I think you know, every Israeli can be deeply proud of what the IDF is doing. And I know that those people who are following it with, with either an open mind or at least a, an objective mind uh, have immense admiration for the way the IDF has conducted this, as I do as well. And I think I also think, like General Avivi, that it is absolutely essential that Hamas is obliterated, and it will be. 
Colonel Richard Kemp, it's a great honor to have you with us today. You are certainly a tremendous advocate and friend of Israel. It's great to have you here in the country. General Avivi, do you have any parting words for us? Yes, yes. I, I want to, Richard, really thank you for everything you are doing. Uh, you are doing an amazing, amazing job in advocating for, for Israel, and especially when it comes from a professional like you, who really understands military issues and uh, has also the ability to compare um, to other armies and uh, understand the challenges. I think this is really amazing. So thank you. But well, really, I don't know what to do with us today. Thank you to you both for joining this briefing. Of course, thank you to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning in. We will be back Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone.